Welcome in everybody to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Baseball Podcast. It is me, Joey P. Joe P. Zapia. And you know what time it is. It's baseball time and it means early drafts. We got best ball going on. We got early rankings going on. They're up right now at fantasypros.com. There's also a lot of buzz going around about a lot of players. So today, my good friend the Welsh and I are going to sit and talk about the 10 players that are breaking draft boards right now. Moving up, moving down. Maybe the value is good. Maybe not so good. We're going to tell you as early NFBC drafting has already begun, and we're going to see if we can help you crack the code on some of these players that I'm sure we're going to talk about Welsh from now all the way into March, because some of these guys right now are definitely buzzworthy. Yeah. And the other word would be like polarizing. I think all 10 of these guys are kind of polarizing, whether it's pulling up or down in drafts. And the idea is these guys are breaking draft boards because this is a lot of the big movement. This is a lot of the big focus. These are things that you might need to be prepared for the early trends if you start checking in around March. Luckily, we're here to help you kind of navigate that whole process, whether it's I've got my uh, ranks primer available, the article you can check out with my ranks over on Fantasy Pros or stuff like this. We've got to try to identify, and that's what we did here. These are the crazies. These are the crazies. Some are going to open your eyes. Some you might not know about, and some you need to take advantage of. So let's talk about those players breaking the draft boards. Let's do it. And don't forget, everybody, the draft wizard is going to be open before you know it. So go to fantasypros.com. Get on that draft wizard. Start using it. Start training yourself, training your brain for baseball drafts. All right, let's start with somebody here in the first spot leading off. Ellie Dela Cruz, uh, one of our favorites on leading off our program last year, Welsh. Somebody we were so excited to see. You got to see him uh, in person before in AFL. And, you know, this is a, a very exciting player. Last year, he was everything you could possibly imagine. The 298 with 1,000 OPS over in 38 games last year in AAA at 21 years old. Then he came out to the big leagues at 13 home runs and 98 games there. Now he only hit 235. And he did have the OBP go from 398 to 301. So clearly the strikeouts are a problem here. But we know the speed he offers too. 35 steals and 13 homers. That is something that's very tantalizing. So we're looking at the ADP right now of 22. It was 19 uh, earlier before in uh, November, December and some of the early ranks that were going on. But Ellie's one of these players that I think we all look at and say, there might not be a ceiling. Like he is that kind of a special guy. Bigger kids got to fill out a little bit more. Certainly there's a little bit more growing physically for him to do. And also the maturation too at the plate in terms of seeing so many pitches, striking out as much as he did. There's obviously a better version of him somewhere. The question is, are we going to see it in year two? Or do some of the struggles and some of the negatives kind of linger into the sophomore season and the perennial sophomore slump that we deal with with so many players? So when you're looking at Ellie De La Cruz, Do you let the excitement kind of get away from you a little bit in this early ADP? Or are you somebody that is thinking, yeah, this is kind of where I want because I want to be in the Ellie De La Cruz business? I think I am the former. I think that's how I say Mm. it correctly. would be the former side of that. That's the first one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I didn't mess that up. I think I got that. In lay terms. That's the first one. In lay terms. But uh, you kind of said it in the very beginning. Like he does everything, but he does everything positively and negatively like the Mm -hmm. one of the hardest hit balls like the third hardest hit ball of the year at like 119 overall which was absolutely absurd big hard hit numbers Uh, i mean the guy stole the three bases and stole home i mean what what he did was great but what he did bad was also not great you know the strikeouts are what are staring us in the face so there's a risk versus reward factor and i know that when you're talking about like breaking draft boards here that number might not seem like a lot, but to move three spots inside the top 25 over a two or three month span, that's kind of eye opening. He has a min pick of 11. So that means some people are comfortable jumping in at 11. I was granted this position in one of my draft champions on both sides, obviously first and second round, and I passed. I've got him lower. Who than did you pass for? Consensus. Just out of curiosity. I went really safe. I went. Freddie Freeman and um, oh man, I'm complete. I uh, maybe Corey Seager. That might okay. have been what my parents. I can understand was. that. I can understand. Yeah, that. it was like a really, really safe. Uh, I would agree with that as, uh, that judgment call that you made, though. I think that's the right judgment call because right now, I mean, where he is on the early ECR on FantasyPros.com, and you can check out the rankings there on FP. Uh, he is a 38th overall player, and that feels a little bit more comfortable. Now, I could argue all the way up to 30. But I understand that when you get into these formats like NFBC, where people are like, look, 
the ceiling is just yeah. too big. We can't let it go because he is one of these guys that if you have him and he figures it out, the power and the speed, the combination of everything he brings. And as you mentioned, the tough part is disseminating the negatives from the fun to watch factor. Cause and, he's and fun to watch. He's exciting. He's likable. You want to, he's good television, but he's not necessarily good fantasy yet as a whole complete project. Yeah. And I think you, you can take your shots in different spots with Elliot. And this is why he like breaks the board because he could fall. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some ranks, some early ranks that have popped out where I've seen some people have him outside the top 100. And it's because people are worried about the strikeouts or where that is going to take away from the top end. He had a 240 XBA, which doesn't leave a lot of room for big batting average. But if he's hitting 240, that's great. Launch angle was crazy low, but it reminded me of Vlad Jr., where Vlad Jr. in his rookie year was like hitting really, really hard, but couldn't get the ball in the air. Ellie had a 3.6 degree launch angle, which you got to get the ball in the air if you're going to really take advantage of those homers. But good hard hit numbers, good barrel numbers. He tied for one of the fastest players, actually tied with Bobby Witt for the fastest sprint speed in the league. But he is going to have a wide range of outcomes, not only in his production, but where he's drafted in leagues. And it just kind of comes probably about the construction that you're putting in. I'm most likely not going to have a lot of shares. I would love Ellie in the third. He will cost you a second. And if he costs you a third, I think you can stomach it, especially if you put together something like a, I don't know, Freeman Endeavors or a Freeman and Riley, or mm -hmm. you could have a Freeman and an outfielder put together there. I think there are definitely constructions that you can do, but he has number one overall player upside, and that's why he has a min pick of 11, but he also has the potential to be outside the top 100 and fall apart with those crazy strikeout numbers, which you know is probably going to push him in some leagues outside the top 50. So he breaks boards across the board, but what is interesting is over the last two months, He's falling down, yeah. even in the big high money leagues where people are taking shots. I like that. Breaking boards uh, all over the boards. That's good. All over the boards. Yes. That's Welsh is a number three for the season. Yeah. Number two on our list, Pablo Lopez of the Minnesota Twins. Coming off a year with his highest strikeout rate in recent memory in his career, uh, NFBC ADP of 37. It was 46 in October, so he's moving up a little bit right now in the Fantasy Pros early ranks. Again, this is a guy who's a top 10 pitcher. He's ranked eighth overall in the expert consensus ranks right now at Fantasy Pros. And again, you cannot deny Welsh. Last year was very eye-opening. You might even say a breakthrough. The ERA was at 3.7, but when you dig deeper into things, you'll see that the XERA was at three, the XFIP was at 3.25. So there's even a better version here of Pablo Lopez to be had. Uh, and Minnesota is a team that still looks to be very competitive this year, despite some of the shortcomings of the American League Central at times that we've all joked about. But Pablo Lopez is one of these guys you have to believe whether or not this guy is an ace or not to draft him at this current top 10 SP value. That's the big question. I know some people aren't sold on that. I feel pretty good about it, and I still feel like he's going late enough where that's one of the two guys I'd like to pair with somebody else. I like him in as a pairing. Like if you give me Pablo Lopez and then a little bit later, maybe the guy we're going to talk about next or maybe a shot at Yamamoto or Logan Webb, that's a good start to a rotation. But what do you think about Pablo? Yeah, and I think one of the things talking about what you're, you're saying is there's actually some good safety pitchers that go a little bit later. I personally yeah. am big into George Kirby this year, but you'd probably have to go back to back Lopez and Kirby, but you can get like a Logan Gilbert a little bit later. Zach Eflin is a really safe option. Logan Webb. So if you wanted to go, you know, third round Pablo Lopez, you have the potential to swoop in and get like a six round Logan Webb, and that's pretty good. But, you know, you're saying in the consensus, consensus ranks, he's coming in at eight. He's going as high as a third SP in NFBC leagues. And it's because of not only what he did, but what a lot of the expected numbers are saying he can get to. Again, that expected ERA was one of the better jumps, three and a half down to three. The strikeout number is close to elite, 29.2% with a low walk rate. And one of the biggest reasons behind all of this was the change that he made. He added velocity to his fastball, which made that better. You don't see fastballs with really, really high whiff rates a whole bunch. Well, he had a 31.5% whiff rate. Usually that's on the secondaries. 23% whiff rate in 2022, over 30% whiff rate on a four-seam fastball. Crazy. But he added a sweeper, and that changed the game. It was his number one whiffed pitch, 36.6%, and he threw it 21% of the time. Previous year, he was fastball changeup. This year, 
fastball sweeper changeup, and even through a higher propensity of curveballs and sinkers. So the whole point of this is, is there is a lot of strikeout potential. He gave himself a strikeout pitch. He added velo and expected numbers are telling a better story. So people are anticipating the expected numbers to have a bigger year. If you think he's going to be top five, you're kind of getting a discount. But this is one of those situations I kind of feel that like the you're already buying him at the price of where I he agree. is going to push. So I it's agree. like you he has he, to return the value at eight. He has to be overall. better to return the value of what you're paying for. So that makes it a little dicey. But he is one of those guys. This is another one of those instances. Mm -hmm. He has risen up draft boards. Uh, I think you said the number. A little bit ago, I think he was, yeah, he was 46 in October overall, and he's jumped into the mid 30s and mm -hmm. he's pushing into the 20s on his mid min pick. So, if you want Pablo Lopez in those strikeouts, you're gonna have to pay a lot, and he's gonna open some eyes when you see him in the draft room. Yeah, he's 39 right now on Fantasy Pros ahead of Zach Allen and Tyler Glass now, which I can understand why. Yeah, uh, but that is an interesting debate, and maybe the best piece of advice is. They're all pretty close. Maybe just take the guy that falls to you at the best value. And I think that's probably when we start getting into our draft season or the shows, you're probably going to see me doing a lot of that. Like, I like these guys, this grouping, just like I liked them last year. And I attack them hard in all those drafts. And I think the same thing here is that you, you attack this grouping uh, because there isn't that much of a difference you know, between them all. And to your point, um, and this is a little bit different, but in that DC I had, Pablo Lopez went in the third round. And mm -hmm. I swooped back and I didn't take a picture in my first three. And then the fourth round, George Kirby fell to me and I took Kirby. Yeah. And it was like, it was Pablo, then Gallon, and then Which I. Which is got funny because Kirby's ranked ahead on Fantasy Pros of Pablo Lopez. So go And figure. I'm probably one of those reasons because because I have him above. <laughs> now, Lopez is the better strikeout option. Mm -hmm. And there is a big push to chase your strikeouts this year. But there's something about Kirby specifically to me that has such a such a great floor. I feel like I can take more risk with guys like uh glass now, or the guy we're just about to talk about. If you wanted to maybe go back to back round pitchers. Well, Tariq Skubal is that guy at number three, NFBC ADP of 50 overall. And last year, what a finish to the season. He had 80 innings. He was seven and three, a hundred strikeouts, just 14 walks, a two, eight, zero ERA, a 0 0.90 whip. And if you think, well, that ERA is unsustainable. You might be wrong because the X ERA was two, three, zero. Uh, two feet, two five six. Excuse me for the X FIP. So this is not a fluke here. Dries Scrubel was straight up dominant, and in terms of left-handed starting pitchers, one of the best in baseball last year over those final eighty innings that he threw. Now the question is, what does it look like over the full season? That's what we want to see. Can he sustain this sort of pace? He was good in twenty twenty two, the three three seven ERA. So a lot of people liked him going in. Uh, secondary numbers were good. Peripherals were good. The WHIP was decent. This was a whole other level. So if he finishes with 165, 175 innings this year with something between 2022 and 23, 23, I think he returns the value of this pick. But what do you think, Welsh? Yeah, I actually think this one is really interesting because it's like it's near Pablo Lopez, but it's quite a bit lower. Mm -hmm. Um Tariq Skubal's got so much going for him. You know, the stuff was incredible. I think it was like the highest expected ERA total. If he qualified of pitchers with 80 or more innings, he would have been number one. The K percentage was absolutely elite. Uh, pulling that up 32.9% with a sub 5% walk rate. That's like exactly what you want. That is what you want in this world of pitching, especially if you're going to try to jump into the strikeout marker. Uh, good fastball almost 96, which was almost two miles per hour more than the previous year. His changeup, absolutely elite, had a 50% whiff rate. One of a handful of pitchers in all of baseball that had a 50% whiff rate on a dominant pitch. We've talked about them over the last couple episodes. So I love Tariq Skubal. One of the only knocks, though, is the people that he faced. He had like a one point something ERA at home and a four ERA away. That's yeah. one little marker because Detroit was a really pitcher friendly environment. But also, if you look at his pitching log, here are the teams that he faced in the month of August. The White Sox, the uh, both actually two White Sox, Angels, A's and Royals. The month prior to that, you did have Yankees and Cubs, but you had Guardians, Red Sox and, and Rays. So you know, the, the, yeah, end but of he pitches in the central and the central soft anyway. So like for me, yeah, no, I, I, I look at that and I'm like, well, he's going to get those teams again. And like, if he was pitching in the American league East, maybe I'd have a little bit more of a concern, right. Or, you know, <laughs> but you know, he's going to get 
a lot of Royals and a lot of Guardians okay. and a lot of, you know, all Let that me ask stuff you this thing. Yeah. You want to talk about breaking these draft boards? You got to break one. Who are you going with? Pablo Lopez in the third or Trick Scoobal in the fourth? Uh, you know, again, if I'm going, I'm, you know me, I'm going hitter early one too. So if I want to double up on pitching, I like having both of them, but I think I keep coming back to the same thing, which is I'm going to take the guy that's cheaper. I don't know if I'm ready to make Scoobal my ace. So once again, if I did take Scoobal, I would probably want to pair him up right away. If I'm going to have Scoobal, I want to also have, as I said, a Logan Webb who I trust, a Framber Valdez who I really trust. You know, are, do they have the same upside as Garrett Cole? No, but I know who they are. I feel good about it. And I want that pairing together. I feel very important. Like doing my three, four, five, if I can away with two pitchers there that I feel really good about as the top two guys in my rotation, two one A's or two high end number twos, however you want to talk about it. That's my approach. Just like it was last year, because Again, you keep seeing the injury factor. You keep seeing the turnover. You see these guys who are aging out, these veterans that were so used to the Verlanders and the Scherzers at the top of the board. Those days are gone. No. And, and the guys that are coming are not quite established yet. Yeah. So you've got to be really careful because it is kind of a – it's a very murky water because if you put too much draft capital into these guys and they don't pan out, you miss out on that offense and it really does set you back in these deeper leagues. Yeah, and, and, and another thing we talked about in the previous episode, like if you tuned out early, there are things that are, a mm -hmm. lot of these guys that are breaking these draft boards that we're talking about, these are things that might be kind of new to you. Like, oh, I'm paying maybe second round for Pablo Lopez and oh, Tariq Skubal's here, but you're going to have to take more shots this year and you're going to have to just be paying attention to your construction. Skubal is another one of those players where you can balance out some of the inherent risk and the the only inherent risk here, lastly, is just the amount of time that he's been able to do this. It's sample mm -hmm. size. 80 innings, though, he was phenomenal last year yeah, phenomenal. in a good hitter environment. He is worth it. And you can break those boards a little bit for Trick School. Now, one guy that uh, we are already in disagreement with, if you listen to the last show and go back and listen to it, you can watch on YouTube also. Uh, Nolan Jones, NFBC ADP of 57 right now. So Welsh is not as big of a fan as I am, and that's okay. We can disagree on things here on the program. This guy had a 2020 season in 100 games, and I understand that it's in Coors Field. I get that, but he's still playing at Coors Field in 2024. So the soon-to-be 26-year-old Nolan Jones is a player that last year in AAA had 12 homers, 42 RBI, hit 356 with an 1,100 OPS. Granted, it was in the PCL, but again, you can't help where you play. Todd Helton played his whole career in Colorado, and damn it, Todd Helton was fun to have in fantasy. So I'm looking at Nolan Jones. I'm looking at the versatility of the guy, and I'm looking at what he can deliver. And I think this is pretty appropriate. Looking around where he's going right now, after Cody Bellinger, before Paul Goldschmidt, right now in our ECR, that feels right to me. What about you? I know you had some hesitations when it comes to Nolan Jones. So let's let's have a bigger conversation about him here since we can today. Yeah, I mean, this, again, th this actually might be like the number one hitter that is going to open up draft boards because people want him. And mm -hmm. similar to Pablo Lopez, Nolan Jones is the Pablo Lopez of hitters this year because everything underlying tells this story outside of like XBA, like his XBA isn't great. He, he had a really good uh, statistical season this past year where he hit 297 with a 2020. His XBA is like 50 points lower, but if he hit 250, we're still going to take him. But what I'm getting at is like, Max EV was 115. He had good hard hit numbers. Overall walk was there. Barrel percentage over 15%. You totally want that with good hard hit numbers. So all of those things play this really good story in a hitter friendly environment. He hit all sides of pitching well, by the way, he hit fastballs yep. and breaking pitches over 300. And lefties and righties over 289 on both of them, 314 Which is against left-handed pitching. And he broke the curse of not being reliant on Colorado. He had right. as many homers away as he did at home. My problem is- And a 900 OPS on the home road yeah. spot too. So he, And hitting a, well, for average also. So I don't get the concern about Nolan Jones because if those numbers were more stark Welsh, then I would say, yeah, you're right. That's kind of a red flag, but I don't see the red flag here when it comes to Nolan. Well, I mean, one of the, okay, well, one of the red flags is, are the strikeout numbers. I want to pull this up here because this isn't but on the thing that I'm looking now. at. I feel like that's something we all have to accept, whether it's Ellie Dela Cruz no, no, or whether it's. You're not wrong about that, but, no, part of it. 
but Nolan Jones is also this like really high end passive. He's one of those guys. Do you remember like Carlos Santana where Carlos Santana would have like a really big OBP and big strikeout numbers sure. because it's like it, the two outcome or the three outcome guy, they walk, they strike out or they get a hit. And I know that seems silly how I'm saying it, but it's like, there's not a lot of nuance in the game. It is going to happen as one of those. So the passiveness can also equate to lower batting average because he's not gonna he's not gonna he's gonna take more walks than he is just getting base hits. He kind of changed it this last year, but I'll throw here's one caveat. He had a 400 Babbitt. That is like the highest in the league, sure. one of the highest Babbitts in the league with expected numbers across the board that say it's gonna fall. Do I think Nolan Jones is not gonna be good? No, Colorado is a great baseline. He puts up big hard hit numbers. I love how he barrels. There's a lot advantage there. He doesn't pull the ball a bunch. Expected numbers don't play in as well. The BABIP is way too high, and I think he's going to come back, back down to earth. I think people are paying for him in the 50s as a 30-30 guy. I think you need to pay for him closer as a 20-20 guy like he performed last year over a full season, and then you can stomach it. Now, does a 20-20 Nolan Jones feel good in the 50s? Maybe. Maybe it still does. I'm not as enamored as everybody else is with him, though there is a story, as I mentioned, uh, of why you would like him in all of those underlying numbers. He is someone that eight out of 10 people in a draft want on their team. He will go higher than consensus. I would guess 70 to 80% of the time in drafts this year. Barrels per plate appearance percentage. He was 24th in baseball last yeah, year. It's beautiful. So I think that accounts for some of that high BABIP that you're talking about. Like, you're going to have a better bat. I think this is where, you know, you, you take that one step further with the deep stats and deep stats are great, but sometimes they make my head hurt. And I'm sure a lot of people who love fantasy baseball, it makes their head hurt too. If you hit the ball hard, it's going to find a lot more spots and you're going to have a higher Babbitt because you're hitting the ball so damn hard. Yeah, so and if you're, and if you're fast and he did, I'm not not arguing any of that. I'm, I'm more pointing at a really high Babbitt in a short sample size sure. with that, that kind of looks a little bit as a warning sign with really high strikeout numbers still. I mean, he, had so if he comes down to 265 strikeout. this year and he maintains the power speed levels. I'll Agreed. take that at this ADP all and that day. Is, and that long. is his projected steamer batting right. average, 265. So you, I agree with you on that. It will work, but there's some things that are going to work here. This is why boards are crazy around Nolan yeah. Jones. 100%. Bobby Miller is the next guy on our list, number five, to talk about the Dodgers' young starting pitcher. NFBC ADP is at 73 right now. Bobby Miller last year, 22 starts for the Dodgers. He was 11 and four, obviously pitching on a very good team, a 3.76 ERA. Uh, the whip was at 1.10 for him last year. He had the caper nine was at 8.6, which if you go back to the minor league level, it's around 11 for him. So that's the one thing for me about Bobby Miller is like, I kind of want to see the elite K guy. You know how I am. Strikeouts are sexy. I like my pitchers to strike out guys because that means they get out of jams with big pitches at big times. Now he was tough to hit to. Just 105 hits at 124 innings. That's also an important one, too. So he made up for that. The walk rate was low, 2.3. So is Bobby Miller a guy you're buying in here? He doesn't have a lot of pressure on him because you got Yamamoto. You got Glass now. We'll see what Walker Bueller, whether or not Kershaw returns. We're still waiting on that news. But Miller doesn't have a lot of pressure on him, per se. But do you think the ADP is worth the investment? Yeah, I do. And this is one of those guys that has been, he's creeping. He's creeping up as people <laughs> want to, uh, they want to be invested in, in him. You know, you talk about the strikeout numbers, 2002 below, he had never had under a 10.7K per nine in the minor leagues. He's always been a high strikeout guy across the minors with a big, big power fastball. Then, you know, there, I mean, it was only like four starts in AAA this year. There's a little bit of a change in, in the process. And then you saw the K numbers go lower. But I'll take that if this is about becoming just a better, more nuanced pitcher. I've said this a whole bunch. So apologies to people. But if you're just tuning in, one of the things I've loved about Bobby Miller, he's one of three starting pitchers, according to Stuff Plus numbers, which Eno Saris has. And this is over on Fangraphs. One of three pitchers to have a fastball that has a 125 plus Stuff Plus and a secondary which in this case is like, I think his slider that has a 125, but he also has five pitches that graded out at a hundred stuff plus or higher. And that is just a hundred is like the, you know, median line. These are above average pitches he has with good control numbers that he threw out to us this year, a great fastball, which is kind of key, which you really want 99.1. He averaged on his four seam fastball. And it's really going to just be about utilizing these secondary pitches because he's throwing five pitches, 15% or more of the time. So you take 
a history of strikeouts with great stuff numbers, good utilage of, of pitches, and put it on the Dodgers for me? Yeah, I'm going to buy Bobby Miller. I want sure. all the shares. He is rising. He's one of those guys that I think a lot of people are also targeting that want on their teams. This is a tough one. He he is one of those young pitchers in this pool of the Yuri Perez's, the Grayson Rodriguez's, and the Bobby Miller's. These guys all kind of break the boards in general. They are going to be high risers. Bobby Miller is one that I definitely want to get in on. You know, and you talked about it earlier. There is a team context. Tariq Skubal, even though we're picking on like, oh, he faced the Royals and stuff. Good, because he's always going to face him because he's in the division. That's a good thing that he's doing yeah. that. Well, guess what? Bobby Miller's on the Dodgers. There's going to be run support every single game, every single game that's out there. And a division that also has like the Rockies and stuff. So, yeah, I I will break my board all day long for Bobby Miller. All right, Jazz Chisholm, the next guy, number six, we're going to talk about NFBC 76. It was 61 back in October, but now he's at 76. So a little bit of a fall there. And I understand why. I mean, you look at the body of work here. It's a lot of incompletes for Jazz Chisholm. Uh, moving to the outfield, too. Now he does qualify in a lot of leagues still at second base. You'll see him on the rankings there, Fantasy Pros. But last year, 19 homers in 96 games, 22 steals. He's a 250 hitter. I think we all know what he is at this point. We've seen enough of them to know like that's where the batting average is going to be. The question is, did he get a full season ever? And the full season, does that equate to a 30-30 guy? And if so, then you're getting kind of a huge discount. It's just a matter of the risk reward. Where do you stand with Chisholm? Yeah, no, you said it perfectly. Uh, you know what I think is really funny? The trend in early drafts are is drafters are just so much less worried about sample size and, re and re repeative production that they can trust versus injuries. They'll mm -hmm. take a guy that had 40 innings or 150 at bats or was good for a final month of the year exponentially over a player that has any injury risk. And that is how early drafts work. And how, and then what that does is that tends to drive what the future price is going to look like. And as you mentioned, Jazz is moving down. Jazz has moved over a full round or in a 15-team riddle. He has moved a full round spot-wise over the last couple months. And we're going to take that into the draft season. My only question, we are, like you said, we know exactly who he is. He had a, a dog crap expected batting average, 224 this year. But we know he is a 240 to 250 hitter with high strikeouts. But we also know the counting stats will be there. You know, whether right. it's, whatever the runs and RBIs look like are relative to the games out there. But there isn't a, a, a production question, can he be a 30-30 guy? It's there. He does it even in his struggles I'm actually down with this. I am down with this, but I think this is the one, and this is why we identify this, you know, in this episode of breaking draft boards and stuff, Jazz Chisholm falling is wild in a world where people are taking big risks to get their stolen bases. A guy like Nolan Jones with a 400 BABIP and is a 2020 guy, people are pushing into the 40s. A guy like Jazz Chisholm, who in his sleep is a 30-30 guy who has strikeout mm -hmm. issues and is probably a 240, 240 or 250 hitter, People are dropping and dropping. I'm going to take, when I'm taking my shots, Jazz will be one I'm willing to take the risk on the injury stuff. Number seven on our list, Josh Young, NFBC ADP at 110. It was at 93, so this is another guy that's starting to go in the opposite direction. Now, to our credit, Welsh, we loved Young last year because he was a free square and we took him everywhere. Yeah. And we looked like geniuses for the first 80 games or so because he had 19 homers in the first half, 56 rubies, hit 280. He was one of the guys at the top of the board for Rookie of the Year in the American League. And then... The bottom kind of fell out. Second half, he played only 34 games. So obviously, health was an issue there, too. Uh, four homers. The batting average dropped from 280 to 229. The OPS went from 835 to 638. So definitely some issues there. Uh, you could tie it to you know struggling a little bit against the right-handed pitching, especially down the stretch. He still hit 14 home runs against right-handed pitching, but that was a problem. The overall picture looks good. But now the draft stock is starting to decline. Do you think that's correct? You know, I actually think we're kind of stabilizing a little bit with him. Like this is one of those. You know, well, so, you know, conceptually, when we're talking about these boards again, like Josh Young is one of those players that I think a lot of people were like, oh, if I could have a little bit late, maybe I would target him. I'm not as enamored with him. I think, again, you give me like really high strikeout stuff with a especially with a guy that is a complete devoid. He's devoid of stolen bases. So right. then you're you, you see one category is gone. 
And then you go, okay, do you believe the batting average? Expect the batting average 260. All right, so batting average isn't a negative, but it's just not quite there. Overperformed on his counting stats with some injury stuff. Counting stats from like RBI and runs. That team just scored so many runs. But can he hit 30 homers? Yeah, absolutely. That's 100% in his game. In the 90s, 80s, did you want really want to pay for that? No. But we're having the same Jazz Chisholm thing happen. There's such an overcorrection happening where people might have waited before. Oh, I can get Josh Young. Now they don't want to. Now you kind of can. You can look back and say, hey, if I can post 100, if my risk is, you know, a the World Series contending top three run producing team, if I can get the corner infielder that is going to hit me 260, 270, 80 plus both sides and 30 homers, that's a much better risk. The injuries are concerned. He had two different injuries that were going on, zapped a little bit of the production, but is is not enamored as I am with Josh Young. Post 100, I think the correction is going in the, the wrong area, yeah. and that is kind of an advantage for people as you are in your draft constructing and looking on. You actually, I think, can now look to like, oh, Josh Young is a backup for me because he is falling down. That is a dramatic, what is that? Almost 20 spots over the last like two months or three yeah, months. It's a good that's amount. A that's for sure. Yeah. It's a big drop. And that, and it's understandable. Like in, uh, there's also a lot of buzz coming around after, you know, the team won the world series. And again, that first half was so good. You know, you're trying to figure out, did he get figured out? Did he not make adjustments? Was it just health? Like what was it? The wear and tear? He had had some injuries previously too, missed an entire season. So was it just, the stamina issue too. Like there's a lot of things you could start to ask yourself those questions, but I think you're right. I think the assessment of the ADP is correct. For and, and, and I wrote about him in the, uh, the uh, black book. People want to check it out. Mm -hmm. The fantasy black book available now on Amazon. This, I, I did the infield and he was one of those guys where, you know, I, I'm really focused on the strikeout rate. I did point out um, something you can take a look at was he really dominated on like inside portions of the zone, but I think pitchers are going to see that he was well below average on both the outside portions of the zone on the top and bottom. So I think you're going to get pitchers that are going to be attacking the outside even more. And he has a really bad pull rate. So what is that going to look like if he gets more outside zone pitching and he's not pulling the ball? I worry that that's going to equate to not as dramatically high results. But again, I like the overcorrection. This is why the overcorrection is good for Josh Young. All right, let's see what's going to be good for the Brewers' young superstar, Jackson Churio, who we all believe is going to start with the big cub. Otherwise, why would you pay him with that giant extension? Yeah. So I'm sure the players' union wanted him to wait, uh, but when people are offering you uh, guaranteed money of that magnitude, it's hard to say no when you're just a boy, and he is still. And that's the one thing you got to temper expectations. The NFBC ADP right now for him is 145, and Churio last year, just in case you weren't paying attention in the dynasty realm to Jackson Churio, uh, in the redraft scenario now, you're going to have to because in AA last year, he had 22 homers, 43 stolen bases at 280, just an 803 OPS. He had six games over in 2023. He did play in the fall league this year, too, where he hit 379 with a 984 winter OPS in uh, the winter league. Pardon me, in the winter league. My apologies. Uh, but Churio is a player that is going to get a ton of attention, and rightfully so. The guy's got power. He is young. Uh, he, you're talking about a guy who could switch it. Like you're talking about a guy who could do it all. So this is a really exciting young player here. So what do you think about Jackson Churio in terms of his 2024 redraft value? Because I think that's the thing that we're all trying to figure out and, yeah. and, and parts it's not about loving the talent or not. It's about loving the talent in this situation he's in. Yeah. So let's get back to the concept of this episode. You want the real players that are going to break your boards. The next three are them because their ADPs are so low in a lot of these pre-draft things, in specifically in NFBC leagues and any league, because there's there's no lack of assurance that they are there. We we assume they are, but people want that little step. If Jackson Churio is named the outfielder, let's just arbitrarily say March first. They say, you know what? It's his job. Like Julio Rodriguez from a previous year, two years ago, where he went from you know, two twenties up into the like high one hundreds pushing inside the top 100 Churio will do the same thing. Churio is already kind of being presumed in that area inside the top 150, but don't get confused. The possibility is that he could go higher inside sure. the top 100 because this is a 2020 guy. Key key factor for him was lowering his strikeout rate previous year, 2022, 28% strikeout rate in high a, 22 in, um, I'm sorry, in A, 22 in high A, and then he went to double A and struck out a whole bunch in a very short sample size, under 19% at double A in 2023. Mm -hmm. 
big power, huge stolen bases, showed the ability to cut the strikeouts down. Steamer projection in 128 games has got him just under a 2020 guy. I think this is a great bet for 2020 season, a good rookie of the year candidate. I think he will break with the team and he doesn't cost you a top 100. That's why this breaks up this whole mm -hmm. thing. When you can get these type of discounts early, you do it. When things stabilize, I think he'll still be worth a top 100 pick. When we get into the 75s and 60s and stuff like that, that's where things get a little bit dicey. But just remember, that's where guys like Bobby Witt and Corbin Carroll pushed inside the top 50. You're getting a discount. This breaks the whole mold. I misspoke earlier too. He's a right-handed batter, not a switch hitter. So I was just so excited about Churio. I forgot that for a second. But uh, you know, when you continue to watch the highlights of him, and I've been watching a lot of him in the offseason, just trying to, you know, again after football season, get up to speed on some of the guys I did not get to see uh, enough of uh, last year in terms of the minor league stuff. Um, the hands are fast, Welsh. The hands are fast. He's a strong kid. I mean, he attacks the baseball. You leave a pitch up in the zone too, he is going to murder it. Like he is that guy. And that's one of the things, too, when you watch him, you see a lot of those balls. When the balls get elevated on him, sometimes that's a problem for young players. That's where you'll see a lot of young players kind of, you know, like the old I like the high ones kind of stuff. You throw a ball up in the zone to this guy, he's going to put it out somewhere in, you know, 500 feet somewhere. And that to me is so impressive. And I think it's because his hands are so fast and he's got such a good, aggressive approach there. Uh, but that's one of those things, too, I think when you look at some of these young players, you know, sometimes you can beat him up high. You cannot beat this guy up high with high fastballs. Like he's going to absolutely murder them. Uh, Wyatt Langford, another play to talk about. NFBC ADP right now, currently at one four. Uh, excuse me, one fifty six. I was going to say forty six, but that would be incorrect. So Wyatt Langford, uh, another player here for us to uh, figure out, <laughs> as it were. Uh, young player here, and for the Texas Rangers, and we're trying to figure out what he is going to be in 2024. You look at the ADP. Do you think this is a player you're going to be investing in at this price? If you go and look at my ranks right now, you will see mm -hmm. I have Wyatt Langford inside my top 100. So yes, I do. Uh, for all intents and purposes, for people I've talked to, the Rangers are expected and their expectation is like, he gets this shot like he they're they're going into camp that he can be one of their outfielders, one of their DHs. They're not looking to replace. They're going to give him every opportunity and his opportunity last year. He went absolutely insane. Uh, he had nine homers in just under 40 games. I think it is or maybe it was 41 total minor league games over double digit stolen bases. Hard hit numbers were through the roof. He hit over 300 at every level. I got to see him uh, in his pro debut out here. I saw two different games in complex level. The guy can run, he can hit, he's patient, high OBP player. He's a he's an advanced college bat that they are going to move. It's a little weird that the team might jump in with like two rookies, Evan Carter and Wyatt Langford. But mm -hmm. I think at this point, guys like Churio and Langford are going to be given the opportunity, if not early. And again, this is like outside the top 100. These are phenomenal spots. But don't be surprised when Wyatt Langford goes inside the top 100. And don't be surprised when the announcement happens that the new norm for both of these players is inside the top 100. You, you mentioned Evan Carter. And last time we talked about him on the show, I was trying to find a comp for him in my brain. And I happened to catch on MLB network. They were running an old, you know, baseball seasons. And there right in front of me was Wally Joyner. And if you are as old as me, you remember Wally Joyner and Wally world with the California angels, then California angels. And very similar kind of stroke left-handed hitter, you know, had, you know, made good contact, had some pop, all these things. And I'm watching and, and people forget, like he kind of was this huge rookie phenomenon. Then he got hurt in the playoffs, had a staff infection in his leg. He was never the same player. He actually, they were up three, one in that series. They ended up losing to the Red Sox. Again, these are useless bits of information, but fun. But that's the guy that he kind of reminds me of. I was watching with these Wally Joyner highlights. We were talking about the 86 angels and I'm going, Ah, that's the Evan Carter. That's the comp I'm looking for in terms of player. And you might have to go back and look at some old things of Wally Joyner to see what I'm talking about. But I think that is kind of the style. And and hopefully, you know, he is able to have a longer, better, healthier career than Wally Joyner had. But people forget when that guy came on the scene, he was like a revelation. And he was a big reason why that veteran club made it to the playoffs at all. I'm not saying this will happen, but I will not be surprised if Wyatt Langford is given the opportunity and runs with it early, that by, let's just say mid-April to May, he's hitting third for this team. Because right now the assumption mm -hmm. is Simeon is leading off, Seager is two, 
Evan Carter would be three. You're probably looking at Josh Young at four, and then they could throw like a Jonah Heim in at five. That's where Young is valuable. If he's going to hit the middle of that order with those guys ahead of him, well, that's a really my good My point spot. to this is you go back-to-back -back lefties with Carter. Carter struggled against lefties. If you have Carter backing up Corey Seager and you're going two lefties, and if, if he struggles and Langford doesn't, then you can go righty-lefty-righty. Mm -hmm. righty. Right. Don't be surprised because Langford, high OBP pl player, really good contact, hard-hit numbers can run. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that a different rookie is hitting three for this team because it ain't going to be Seager and Simeon. Those two are locked in, so that spot is open. And if it does, but there's a lot of speculative stuff here. Hmm. Well, last guy, we're gonna, <laughs> last guy we're going to speculate here on today, number 10, Junior Caminero, NFBC 217. Now, obviously, there's going to be some openings in the infield and the Tampa Bay situation. So Caminero is just 19 years old. He'll be 20 this year if you go back and look at last year's stats for him. Um, look, it's, you're, you're talking about a guy who played as high as double a last year. You're talking about a guy that showed you 20 home runs there in 81 games at double a, he had 356 at single a before that at high a, uh, over 36 games, he had 356 at a thousand OPS at a 921 OPS in those 81 games at double a. So it seems like he is ready for at least that audition, but it's Tampa and Tampa is that one thing that we always so no, oh, no, what are they going to do? How are they going to act now? Rules have changed. So it's easier to do this nowadays. And there, the need is more obvious now. So do you think that Caminero gives us enough of a season to warrant the 217 ADP that he's currently going at. Yeah, I, I actually think Caminero could be one of the biggest values in drafts right now. And this is another one of those guys. If they said tomorrow that Caminero is the starting third baseman, mm -hmm. top 125 without question. Maybe it, inside the top 100, I think is in the realm of possibility as well. He came up, he was fine in his, uh, what was it, seven games that he played. He went into the uh, offseason, played in the Dominican Winter League, I think hit another six homers in like 20-something games, absolutely dominated. Here's the deal with that lineup, though. Currently, it says Isak Paredes is their third baseman, and they just traded for Jose Caballero, who's going to be their shortstop. Well, Paredes has been in trade rumors the entire offseason and could be shipped out. DHing right now, Richie Palacios, who you, I know you love. My point of all this is to say there's open spots if he's going to play third base. Paredes, if they kept him, could play DH. You can put him there. Yes, I think 450-plus plate appearances is a good bet. It's post 200. He's got 30 plus power. He's an electric bat. There's no speed that's really in there. But this is one of those guys you talk about, oh, you can wait for Josh Young. You can wait for Caminero. He's a target in every single draft. And really, the, braid, the, the board breaking is going to be about who the person is in the draft that decides to pull the trigger on him. Cause I think he can push inside the top 150. And like I said, if the announcement happens, you want to bet on a 30 plus home run power rookie hitting mm. near the middle of the Rays lineup. Absolutely. And you will bet near the top 100 if they give him that spot. But to your point, he didn't play in the minors past uh double a, but they no. did give him the opportunity in the majors. But physically, he looks like he's ready too. Oh, like the, yeah. the physical build of him, the lower half is very strong. We always still look at Evan Carter and I go like, he's still got some growing to do. He's got some filling out to do. So does Elio Cruz to a certain extent, but he's such a tall guy. It's a very different set of circumstances. So, you know, the tall lanky guys, it'll sometimes it takes a little while there. But when it comes to Caminero, it's very different. Like Caminero yeah. looks like a guy who's playing right now. He looks like a, a lot like the guy he's probably going to be replacing in that infield eventually in terms of what he means to the Tampa Bay Rays. Yeah, and, and he uh, won't be but, in he won't be in it short. But, uh, you know, listen, no, no. I, I've said this and people know this, but I talked to Carson Williams, who's the top shortstop prospect for the Rays. I talked to him in the AFL. And one of the first things out of his mouth was like, Junior Caminero is the best player I've ever played with. He's the best player I've ever seen play mm -hmm. with in person. And he joked, he's like, you know, when – uh, when someone wants to talk defense, they come to me. When someone wants to talk offense, we go to junior. And those are two, those are the two guys you probably see by the end of this year, manning that side. Caminero's home is at third base. And that's why focus on Paredes. If Paredes is gone and traded, I think they have made full room for it. And again, I have asked some team personnel. And the thing I keep hearing is, yeah, people love the idea of getting this extra pick when a play, because junior Caminero will be, if he breaks camp, He's eligible. If he were to win rookie of the year, he will be eligible for that extra rookie compensation. It's not even about the pick. It's that player pool money that these yeah. team want. And what do the Rays love? They love to save their money and not pay their players. So if there's any team that would make sense this day and age, it would be for Caminero to break camp and them to get that extra pool money. Yeah. He breaks boards and he should be on your team.
what I like about Caminero when I watch him too, and this is why I think he is ready. It, it, there's times where it does. It looks like he doesn't get all of it, and the ball still goes out. Yeah. That's power. That's strength. That's yeah, he's got opposite who, field power yeah, for sure. You know, like some, you know, a lot of young players, like you know when they get it and when they don't. There's times where he hits the ball and you're like, oh, we didn't get all that one. The ball goes out. Kind of like how Roy, like Royce Lewis was doing that earlier. A little bit of that. A little bit of that. that. Uh, a little bit of that like kind of feeling too. Yeah. And I think that's one of those things when you look at young players, you know, in terms of are they physically ready to handle themselves at the major league level with some of the pitching they're going to see and the wear and tear of the season, all that stuff. Like I look at that body type. I look at what he's doing in terms of the swing. There's times, like I said, where he gets all of it and you know it. And other times where you don't think so and the ball still goes out and you go, wow. Like he just literally took that one and muscled it out there. And that's very impressive for a player at 19, 20 years old. That's a very impressive thing. So what do you think about all these players? Drop your comments below in the YouTube channel. Let us know. And of course, make sure you subscribe to the Fantasy Pros MLB channel over on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts, the Fantasy Baseball podcast over at Fantasy Pros. Go check out the rankings at fantasypros.com. And of course, the Draft Wizard open for business very soon. Go check it out. Keep looking any day now, any hour now. It should be there ready for you to start practicing. And you can see where these guys are going for yourself. That'll do it for us, but the story of the game goes on. For the Welsh, I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids.